Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We're the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Worcester, across the Pike to Fenway, and all stops in between. Thank you for listening to this. Ian, I believe it is our 250th episode, at least as we're numbering them, of the podcast. Thank you all for downloading and listening and for supporting us uh, for years now. And we're at 250, and that's pretty sweet. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of Sox Prospects. And I'm joined, as always, as I've been for the vast majority of those 250, frankly. Um, shouts out to Chris Mellon, Matt Hegel, John Mioli. Who else? Who am I missing? I'm missing Mike Andrews, Ian, Theor- Ian Theodoridis. Who else used to join us? I'm missing someone big. I know I am. I can't remember who. But at any rate, uh, Ian Cundall. Ian, uh, happy 250th episode to you. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, this it just feels like another episode to me. So I'm not a, not is, a big, I'm not a big not, mile. I'm not a big milestone or a yeah, we're not celebration going big person. This. So uh, yeah, just yeah. just just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> yeah, we're not going big on this one. We did. I know we did. I'm bloom for 200, but um, at the rate we're doing these, we're coming up on milestone episodes every year. So you know, we'll 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 go big when we need to. But uh, today, well, doesn't mean just because we're not going big doesn't mean there's not plenty to talk about. We've got yet another promotion of Sedan Rafaela from Greenville to Portland. We'll talk about that. Nick York's back. He was on the IL with Turf Toe. He's back as of today. We'll talk about Brian Mata's return uh, to the mound in a game that we can see slash get stats on uh, down in Salem as he begins his rehab assignment. Uh, the DSL and FCL season started, so we'll talk a little bit about what's going on at the complex. Might talk a little bit of Jaron Duran coming up and going back down. I've, I've got some thoughts. I don't know if anyone's got any. Of course, as always, we'll get to your emails, which you can send to podcast at SoxProspects.com because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. And of course, first, if you want to support the show, make sure you uh, rate and review us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is that you are listening. Tell a friend, phone a, phone a friend, tell a neighbor, talk to someone on the street, tell them about the podcast. And of course, you can support us on Patreon.com slash SoxProspects. And of course, we need to mention, Ian, that right now we are doing the Sox Prospects donation drive. We do this once a year. We keep the site free. We keep the podcast free. I know we have certain uh, special content for our Patreon supporters on Patreon.com, but we like to keep the site free. We like to keep the content generally free, and we're able to do that through the generosity of folks who, um, who donate to the site through our donation drive and through Patreon. If you can, if you want to donate, you can follow the links. Uh, there's a link on the news page and you can go to socksprospects.com slash donate. If you're just of the one-time donation type, if you like what we do and want to support us, go ahead, throw some in there. You know, as, as, as a famous movie once said, we like the money that clinks. Uh, the, oh no, you know, what we'll go with, it's the, it's the era of TikTok. I was going to go with the coming to America reference, but, um, we, 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 want, we like my, we don't like money that jiggle jiggles. We like money that folds, put it that way. Um, I probably butchered that, but you know what I mean? Anyway, I'm just most, I'm joking. Uh, but if you want to support the, support the podcast, support the website, support what we do. Um, we appreciate it again, socksprospects.com slash donate. Uh, but Ian, let's jump into it. Uh, the big news for me right now, I think is the promotion of Sidon Rafael, currently the number 14 prospect on the rankings. I had to kind of keep myself in check a little bit to rank him where I did. Uh, And we all kind of had him in roughly the same range on our rankings, but as far as what this promotion means or anything, we discussed this a little bit in the Slack. It's on the, not a, it's not an aggressive promotion. I thought it was at first, but after talking it through, it's on like the aggressive side of normal. He's at like just over 200 plate appearances in Greenville. Uh, We know about the stellar defense. He hit very well in Greenville. Moving up to Portland, I guess generally, what, what is your take? Well, I'll open the floor to you. What are your takeaways from the promotion? What what comes to mind? What did you think when you saw it? What are you thinking now that you thought it over? To start off, I wasn't that surprised. I think that you look at Portland, and I yeah. think that their defense has really been impacting the pitching staff. And I think one way to help that out is to get a guy like Raphael in there, whether he's playing shortstop or center field. He's by far the best defender on that Portland team now. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a nice, uh, you know, boon to the pitching staff there. But I, I think he was, you know, it was kind of 
a good challenge move for him. He's someone who they have to make a decision with the 40 man roster this off season. Obviously I think it's trending towards him being added. And oh, for sure. I, I it, don't think there's a question. And I think that it's just, a, it, it's good for them internally to see what he can do against more advanced pitching. Cause even with there's some red flags, I think like behind the scenes with his, uh, his approach and kind of things like that. Um, some of his, you know, some of his, what? if I could jump in by behind the scenes, you don't mean like makeup questions. No, no, no. I mean yeah, like yeah. I just the, sure the advanced clear. statistics that are not publicly available about him mm-hmm. at the plate. Uh, there's definitely some red flags there. And I think that the fact that even with those, he was hitting 330, you know, 368, 594 showed that he needed a new challenge. And I think that I wonder if, you know, part of the thinking was we'll promote him to a more aggressive level. He's going to see better pitching. And, you know, if, if it doesn't work there, then it's like, okay, maybe I do need to, you know, be a little more patient, um, you know, not ma- try to make, try to make, be some more selective and improve quality of contact, not chase as much, things like that. And so, um, I think that, you know, that's going to be tested at the double A level. You know, he had like a 24, 25% strikeout rate and like a 4% walk rate in high A. Um, it's hard to get all the way up the system carrying those rates. And so, you know, I, I really think that he he needs work on his approach. And I think that, you know, exposing him to more advanced pitching, if, if especially with the way he was handling high A, is the way to do that. And it's to show him, you know, if you want to make it to the majors, which obviously is the goal of everyone, you need to, you're going to have to be more selective. You're going to have to, you know, put together better at bats. And I think that double A is a better place for him to do that right now. And Mm -hmm. I think another thing, as I said, going back to the glove is like his glove is good enough that there's no point in having him in the low minors with that glove in terms of like, there's no, there's no concern that, you know, Oh, he needs to develop like glove wise, like sure. It it will play there. Just it's fine. It's all going to be about his, his upside and future is going to be determined by what he does at the plate. And, you know, there's still a wide range of outcomes, you know, he could be, could be just like an up and down or guy up and down, like emergency guy. He could be, you know, an everyday guy. Um, You know, there, there's, there's a wide range of outcomes and it's all going to depend on how the approach and his hit tool develops. Two things that I would throw in there too are, are, you know, when you look at the numbers, you got to keep in mind, he had a 409 average on balls in play in Greenville. So, you know, you would expect a little bit of regression on those numbers as that normalizes back down to about 300 or wherever it winds up. So there's that piece of things. The other thing that I wonder about is, you know, he was with Portland, quote unquote, in camp pretty late. He was with Portland the whole time we were there, I think. And when I remember going into the year, looking at the roster we had projected for Portland and looking at the roster we had projected for Greenville, you wonder how much the composition of the lineups at those two levels plays into this in the sense that if you think he's ready to be able to handle Portland, pushing him might be best for all involved. When you look at the outfield in Greenville, where Tyler McDonough and Gilberto Jimenez are not getting very many reps in center field at all because Rafael is playing there four or five days a week. Um, You know, you want Rafael to get that one game at shortstop as well. Fine. He's probably still going to get about the same in Portland, but you look at the Portland outfield, you've got Devlin Granberg playing center field every day, who, as you've mentioned on the show, is okay there. Nobody projects Devlin Granberg to be a major league regular center fielder, right? And you've got, you know, left field right now, I think is like a timeshare between Tyler Dearden and Will Dalton. Will Dalton's playing all over. Izzy Wilson is your everyday right fielder right now. You've got Pedro Castellanos getting occasional outfield reps. I think there's a lot more room for Rafael on that roster. And it also resolves the log jam you had in the outfield in Greenville where like Nick Decker's having to DH a lot because not again, you know, he's clearly the the lowest of the four on the totem pole, but like you'd like him getting outfield reps, right? So to me, I wonder how much that played into it as well. Maybe it did a lot, maybe it did a little, um, but that that's just something that came to mind to me. So it's promotion season. That's always fun. Uh, we'll see how Rafaela does. Do we know how he did tonight, Ian, in his, Debut in in double A. Oh, for four. Lineup. Strikeouts. No strikeouts. All hit. All balls in play. All right. Well, there you go. There's that ball in play look coming back at him. But anyway, yeah. Good luck to sit down, Rafael, in double A. Uh, moving on. One of the counter moves in Greenville. I guess we should mention the first counter move was uh, Brandon Howlett getting sent back down from double A to or yeah from double A to high A. Uh, just way too many strikeouts. I mean, need something needed to give. Clearly, the bat was not working at Double A at this point. Send him back down. It makes sense. See if 
maybe he can get on track in Greenville. But that said, I don't know where he's getting at bats from because they've got, you know, they've got Benellis and uh, Northcutt splitting the reps at third and first. Uh, they've got a full outfield. So Howlett's going to be hard pressed to play more than three, four times a week, I think, in that roster. So we'll see if he can get it going in part time looks, uh, and maybe get back up to double A. Uh, but much more importantly, Nick York activated from the IL with his turf toe, apparently sufficiently dealt with. And uh, also back in the lineup tonight at home against Asheville. And he went uh, one for four uh, with a couple Ks. So he'll have a little time to shake off some rust. Another another Lugo home run and another McDonough triple tonight in Greenville um, with Shane Drohan whiffing or striking out 14 and five and two thirds, which is always fun to see. That's easily the strikeout performance of the year in the system. But Ian, um, good to have York back. I don't know if there's too much more to say about it. Uh, and I guess we might as well update. I don't know if I, uh, when we did the last episode, if we mentioned that Tristan Costas was heading down, I th- actually, I think you did say was heading down to Fort Myers to rehab, not on the FCL roster, which I think is a little interesting. Uh, apparently just down there getting his work in is really what it is and rehabbing with the staff down there. So um, we'll see how long it is before he gets in the games. I would presume he would have a rehab assignment in Fort Myers while he's down there, but uh, I don't know if you've got anything to add on either of either of those situations. So moving on. No, not really. I mean, how it's tough, but I mean, not surprising. He, uh, they have too many infielders there and he's really struggled and uh, York. Yeah. We'll see what happens when he comes back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, moving along to, to yesterday was the opening day for the Florida Complex League and the Dominican Summer League rookie ball. In other words, uh, stateside rookie ball, FCL Red Sox have had a couple of games. Uh, the DSL, there are two Red Sox teams, DSL Red Sox Blue and DSL Red Sox Red, although they're like DSL Boston Blue and Boston Red on MILB.com now. I don't know why that's changing, but at any rate, they're playing. Um, for whatever reason, DSL, or not for whatever reason, there's 49 DSL teams. So on any given day that teams are playing, someone is off and the DSL Red Sox red were off Tuesday. So they only played on Monday. DSL blue has played a couple games. Um, I guess previewing Ian, those rosters, let's start in the Florida complex league. Cause it's probably more meat on the bone there. It's kind of interesting. And it gets back to this discussion we've, we've had a number of times last year of, they really need to expand that domestic reserve list by 10 because right now the Red Sox have 36 guys on this roster who are healthy. Uh, Luis Ravello is the shortstop who is in our top 60 is out injured with a hand injury on this roster. There and are, we should say Ravello had a very good extended from what we understand. So yeah, that's a, that's a tough that one a tough for him. Loss. Tough loss for him. Uh, but you just look at this roster. There are legit nine outfielders that need playing time. Um, there are six catchers, um, and arms. I mean, I think they'll get the innings for the guys they need to get the innings for, but you know, meanwhile, then you look the, the, you know, so you say, well, why don't they have two teams? Well, you know, with 36 guys, yeah. With the reserve list where it's at, they could probably add another eight and make it 44 Two twenty-two man teams is tough. Uh, when you think about pitching, when you think about having enough guys for every position, on this roster right now, they have basically five healthy middle infielders or middle infi- middle infield and third base infielders. It's it's tough to get a full roster with that composition or two rosters. I should say from that comp- composition, maybe they bring up a couple more guys from the DSL to play the middle infield, but you get a couple injuries and all of a sudden, you know, you're playing guys out of position. But um, I don't know. What are some names, Ian? I guess I'll throw to you for what are some names on this roster that You've got your eye on that you're keeping an eye out for, I guess, starting on the hitting side. I know the first one you'll probably go to, but what are some names that people should look out for? I think the first one is pretty obvious. It's our eighth ranked prospect um, outfielder, Miguel Blaise. Blaise, Blaise. Blaise. He, uh, he's very exciting. And I, I think, you know, we kind of talked a lot about it after spring training, um, how much, how, how highly we thought of him, how impressed we were and, it's, you know, it's fun to be able to now get a look at the box score and kind of get some reports on him um, from, you know, in real games. And he, he also was someone we heard at a really good extended. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely excited to kind of see what happens with him because 
his upside is definitely among the highest in the system, even though he's currently ranked, I think, like eighth in the top, you know, 60. Yeah, Rob Bradford had um, Bianca Smith, the coach who's down there on his show, and she mentioned him as someone who really just stands out among a very talented outfield group. So it, it, they even think that highly of him internally as well. It's not just from the outside looking in. Uh, who else you got on that roster? It's kind of, I think it's really pretty, for me, it's pretty outfield heavy, although there's maybe maybe the next guy to go to is Lyra. Um, and or so Lyra, who's the starting catcher um, down there. It started on opening day. Uh, yeah. At least. Yeah. I, I think that after that, I, I obviously there's a pretty substantial drop off. Um, after but I think, Blaise, yeah. you mean? Or yeah. After Lyra? Yeah, yeah. And after, I, I think Lyra is kind of in a group with it's him and like Ravello. And maybe you can put someone like Juan Chacon in that group. Um, if, yeah, you're Chacon, a, if you're a Chacon m- fan. Maybe Garcia, but I wouldn't. Um, no, yeah, I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, Lear, Lear is interesting because I, I was I was talking talking about him with someone actually yesterday. We were laughing trying to predict what his line is because he's just a weird player in the sense that he has a really really good batting eye and he's going to walk a ton because he's super passive. But his like overall line, other than OBP, might not be that that impressive, and it wouldn't worry me at all. Like I wouldn't be surprised if he hit like two thirty with like a three fifty OBP and a three hundred slugging. Right, and right. it's just because he's he's almost too passive at the plate, but at the same time, the umpires down there are not good, and right, yeah, he almost yeah. and this is the same thing that happened in the DSL. Is he's got like a better eye than the umpires do. And so, like, he'll just strike out on pitches that just aren't strikes. And mm-hmm. I, I, and you, he'll just be like, yeah, I mean, what do you want me to do? I'm not going to swing at a pitch that isn't a strike. And so I'm interested to see how he, he does. And, um, because I, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is like kind of like an average year and then next year's the breakout. Cause he also is definitely growing. He was a lot, uh, bigger than I expected based on what I yeah. heard from last year. And I still think he, he's developing physically and kind of like learning yeah. to use his own body. So, I'm definitely interested and excited to see him, but at the same time, I he's 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 someone where I wouldn't read too much into the numbers if they're bad. Basically, is my what I'm getting at because mm-hmm. a he's a catcher, but who are notoriously a little slower to develop. But b it's just the way his game is. It's not it's not set up to excel or like you know put numbers that blow blow off like blow you away. You know, he's someone who it's the defense, it's the approach, it's things like that that translate better the higher you get up in the system. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And uh, it's, uh, you notice the body is definitely, you know, it's almost not, not Bambi, but like, but it's like, there's clearly development left to happen. He's learning uh, his, body. his body yeah. still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess looking on the pitching side, Ian, interestingly, like Jose Ramirez getting the opening day start was interesting to me. He was a guy who pitched three years in the Dominican summer league <laughs> and it, it built around the lost 2020 season. He made his DSL debut in 2018. Um, he's rule five eligible this off season and he's pitching in the FCL, but got the opening day start at 22, at uh, 21. And we're hearing the stuff, you know, has certainly improved. They, they apparently unlocked something with him, but not, he's not, it's not to the degree that like, we're going to rank him or anything. They just, you would think three years in the DSL is like an auto cut guy and they actually like him. But the the guy. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. Up, I will say, I wouldn't read anything into the opening day starter. I, I no, asked, no, no, no. I asked. I, I texted someone about that, and they're like, "Yeah, teams usually don't throw their best guy on opening day." So, well, a yeah. lot of the time, what you'll have is like a guy who's returning. If it's like an affiliate, like a guy who was there last year, will get the start, or you know, it's almost like a reward for a guy who's worked hard or something like that. The guys that stand out in that pitching staff for me, Ian, are Luis Perales. Uh, Jettix and Paez. Um, and then, you know, some lower level guys after that, like an Elmer Rodriguez Cruz, a Francis Hernandez, potentially your Donnie Monegro was an interesting name from the DSL last year. Um, fair number of guys to keep an eye on and we'll see who pops. I mean, Luis De La Rosa is down there. One of the guys they got back, um, for it, it got back in the Andrew Benintendi trade who did not have a good year last year and who we did not love in spring training. Maybe he figures something out. Uh, that was generous. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that the guys I'm most interested to see are Paez and Perales and Elmer Rodriguez Cruz. Um, starting with Paez, who threw today, I think he threw like five innings, yeah, three, yep. three runs or something, four yeah, strikeouts. Uh, like, was it even three runs? I don't remember. It, it was, it was good. It was a good outing for him. Yeah. Um, he's super young and 
he still has a lot of development physically to go, but I've just been impressed with the strides he's already made. Like his velo has already ticked up like almost a full grade and a half. He was like 84 to 86 last year. Now he's all the way up to like 88 to 90 topping out at 92, Mm -hmm. but he's just got really good feel for secondary pitches. So he's someone who I think actually could do pretty well because of the secondary pitches. And it's just about him continuing to develop velocity and develop physically. Um, Whereas on the flip side, the other two guys are, they have velocity like paralysis up to 98 um, Elmer Rodriguez Cruz apparently up to 95, 96. So for them to, for them to, obviously the velocity is nice. It's about, you know, they got to refine that fastball command and develop those secondary pitches. So it's, it's, it's an intriguing bunch of arms down there. Definitely. Yep. For sure. For sure. Um, moving on down to the DSL and I think it's a little bit more elementary. I mean, the, the big names are the two short starting shortstops for the two rosters in uh, Framey de Leon in, uh, for the Red Sox blue roster and uh, Fraley Encarnacion in, uh, on the DSL Red Sox red roster. Those are the two big bonus babies from uh, this past international signing period. Uh, they both had terrific opening days uh, to start the year. Uh, and some other names that are interesting down there, keep an eye on, you know, in the middle infield, uh, Marvin Alcantara, John Cell Santana. Um, they got a couple of interesting guys in the outfield too. It's kind of interesting. Johan Fran Garcia, the third highest bonus from this January, didn't play on opening day um, for the DSL Red roster. They, they played Rennie Flores there, who was a returning guy. So again, don't necessarily read into it. He's going to get playing time. They, they split the catcher reps usually. Um, and then on the mound, you know, some guys who got, Decent size bonuses. Uh, Yisrael Burnett is probably the, you know, biggest name down there for me. He's on the DSL Red Sox blue roster. He is repeating the DSL. Um, signed out of Curacao for 125k in the last international signing period. Had a pretty good start to his career last year, but he only got 17 innings before he went down with an injury. So, more or less repeating, probably just to get those reps. Not impossible. We see him stateside at some point, depending on how things break, you know, with the Florida, with the uh, Florida roster. Um, but we can go from there. Um, and then another name, maybe to keep an eye out on eye out for is William Colmenares, uh, the highest bonus pitcher in this year's international signing class. He got 125 K as well out of Venezuela, uh, making his debut. He pitched today and he actually had, he had a very good uh, first start. I think he went three scoreless. So Good debut there for him. Um, anyone else on the DSL rosters you're keeping an eye on, Ian, or or that you've has caught your eye for w- one reason or another? Um, not really. I think obviously I don't I don't know a lot about the guys there other than what yeah. we know about when they they signed. Um, right. Which is yeah. generally not much. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm interested to see what the 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 two Fs do. Um, Fraby and Fraley. Um, I'm interested to see what uh, J- J- uh, Josh Nixon's brother does, John Fran Garcia, because he got a he got a decent little bonus. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's I'm more right now. I'm definitely more focused on the FCL because um, I think that that's a very interesting team. You know, with even beyond the guys we talked about, like Ab- Abram, Leendo, Lionel James, um, John Frank Salazar. Uh, we didn't really talk about Juan Chacon, him. Um, Yo, Stinkson. Brian Gonzalez, Joss Nixon, Alexis Hernandez, Alan Castro. Like, there's a bunch of guys down there that are interesting to me. So, um, yeah, that's more where my uh, my attention is focused right now. Obviously, I like like looking at the DSL box scores, but until I see those guys at instructs, they're kind of you know a little little off out of my purview. And it can go either direction too, right? Because you can have a guy down there who has a completely nondescript DSL season comes to the U.S. and all of a sudden, you know, you're just whatever, you know, or, you know, or has a non sorry, has a nondescript season down there, comes in and blows people away and instructs and is the talk of instructs or it could go the other way. That guy can have a really good statistical season down there, comes stateside. And it's just really disappointing. You know, it's a, you know, guy who puts up big strikeout numbers with good command comes to the U S and he's throwing 90, you know, it's like, Oh, well, that's not as exciting as we thought it might be. Maybe there'll be projection there and maybe it's all projection, but yeah, I mean, like pa- Paez is a good example of that. Like, if you look at his numbers, he had like a three eight six ERA. Like, that's fine. Like, 49, 49 strikeouts, nine walks is good, and that's legit. His command is for his age is remarkable. But yeah, there's not like you know, it's not like he's striking out like two guys per inning, or he's got you know a sub two ERA and a sub you know one WHIP. Like, mm-hmm. his numbers don't jump off the page. But when you see him in person, it's like, ooh, this is interesting. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll see. 
we'll see where that goes. Um, but yeah. And by the way, if you're in Fort Myers, the Florida complex league games are free. Uh, make sure that they're playing. I think they generally, I think they don't play on Wednesdays and Sundays if I remember right. Um, and I know that uh, every Friday and Saturday they play either at or at home against the twins. So if you're in town, those days, they are definitely around in some part of town. Um, but check the schedule before you go, because the home games are free. They're inside JetBlue Park uh, for the most part. So go check them out. Uh, it's it's the chance to watch a bunch of guys who may or may not be the Red Sox future um, for free in a, a really kind of interesting setting. So um, check it out and make sure you, you know, we'll, we'll obviously be talking about what's going on down there as well, as you all well know. But moving on, Ian, I guess the last thing I kind of wanted to mention, Jaron Duran got another brief call up to the major leagues because of um, Jackie Bradley Jr. going on the bereavement, uh, not bereavement list, geez, quite the opposite, the paternity list. I, are you at the point where, look, at some point soon, in theory, the Red Sox are going to gonna have to go back to four bench players. Are you at the point where you're ready to see them give Duran a shot. And and, I mean, the thing is the offense is going well right now. So I don't know that it's necessarily the time, but it's just, and and I don't know that the way to fit him in is very obvious, but it's just, if you've got a guy who you're leading off when he's up, he brings that speed element that no one else in your offense can give you. He's hitting the ball well in triple a he's hit pretty well in the majors when he's been up this year. I just, it's, it's, you know, having that, kind of an option in triple a it seems like you would want to try and fit him in but i think that just the problem is there's no obvious way to do it yeah i I think that with the way the offense is going i do not think there's a need for him and i think the the bigger issue to me still is that the impact he'll have on the defense because if you're playing him you're either benching jackie bradley or enrique hernandez and like i think it it was telling that he, they didn't even play him in center field when he came up for the stretch. He was only playing right field, which obviously I guess put Bradley away. It makes sense, but right. he's, he's his impact on the defense, I think is going to outweigh any additional benefit his bat gives. Cause I think kind of like the Delta between his defense and Bradley's or Hernandez's and their bats is not, the bat is not big enough to overcome that defensive deficiencies. And I think that's why you're going to see him in that yo-yo role until one of them either gets hurt or something happens. Because it's just, you know, the, the offense is, is clicking fine with those two struggling, but now coming around a little bit to the yeah. point where you don't want to, you know, you don't want to potentially risk the pitching, which I think has been the most consistent aspect of their team this year, the starting pitching, at least. Um, I don't think you want to risk, you know, messing with that and kind of impacting their ability to run down fly balls by putting in someone who's not as good as defensively as what they're used to having out there. Um, and I think that's why he's kind of caught in no man's land. And frankly, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he's someone that they look to deal at the deadline for an upgrade or, you know, a different position that can help the team that makes more sense for the team. Even with Hernandez set to become a free agent. Well, cause I don't think he's a center fielder. Like, well, no, I know he's not, but you've got Jackie Bradley for a more year in theory. And I don't know why you wouldn't exercise it for 4 million. Right. Yeah. I mean, but I don't think they necessarily want Bradley playing center field at this point in his career. I think that his, he's played mostly right field the last two years. And I wonder, do wonder if his speed is something that they're concerned about in center field. Cause he's, he's obviously an instincts guy and that's fine in right field, but in center field, I think you want someone who might have, um, I'm not saying that he can't play it anymore. It's just interesting to me that, that both the Brewers and the Red Sox have kind of primarily played him in right field the last two years. Right. Right. It's interesting. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a weird fit. It's a weird situation. I mean, it, it's, like I said, I th- to me, the big thing is that it's not even like like you've always mentioned. It's not like you can platoon them with Bradley because they hit from the same side of the plate. So that doesn't even really make sense. So we'll see how they do that. It's just I know a lot of people are like, well, you know, you know, Christian Arroyo is on the roster. It's like, well, Christian Arroyo is on the roster to be a bench guy. Um, so we'll see, you know, that that's his role. And I don't think you want to call Duran up to be a bench guy. Um, we'll see what they do when they expand uh, or not expand, but when they have to change and have one more uh, bench player and one fewer reliever. But I mean, that's that's the that's the upcoming elephant in the room, because that's right. I mean, assuming it doesn't get pushed back again, which I feel like it's been pushed back every time we've wanted to discuss it. Right. Right. But that's now what the 13th, I think, is when it has to happen. Is it the 13th? I thought it was even I later. I think it's the 13th. But like either I way, think, it got pushed back. I mean, to me, there's there's two. I think there's three options. It's a ruse, three. which is the easy one. Like he's just you don't care if he plays. You just he's just a bench piece. Sure. You know, he's whatever. already on the 40. Exactly. 
it's Duran because you're like, we want more of an impact. He's someone who can be a pinch runner. He, we can start him. We can rotate, you know, Hernandez and Bradley out of the lineup more, or it's the wild card, which is Fitzgerald, but I'm not sure what he's been doing lately at the plate to warrant it. But I just think it's interesting that he, they're even exposing him to even more positions right now. Mm-hmm. And kind of played a lot of like, third and first lately. Yeah. They're kind of, again, getting, part it's partly in, it's partly due to the fact that, like I mentioned last episode, that's the construction of the Worcester roster right now. With Casas on the IL, yeah, those are the I mean, two places. I mean, and if you look, Fitzgerald, like he's he's definitely been in a slump as of late. Um, it's not loading baseball reference, but yeah, he's hitting 143, 244, 171 over his last nine games, 41 plate appearances. But before that, obviously, he was in. You know, the you take the previous, you add in like the previous three games, and he had two hits in each of those. That really changes. But yeah, it's just his last like ten games have kind of been a struggle. Yep. Which happens. I mean, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong, um, but that's, yeah. No, I mean, but but that's the concern right. with him is like, it's the hit tool. Like, you know, it, it, his, 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 it's a very all or nothing approach and it's definitely worked well against AAA pitching, but there are concerns about how that would translate against more advanced pitching who either won't throw him pitches in the zone or just can beat him with fastballs up. Yeah. I think it partially depends on what they want to though, because like, if you want a bench outfielder, like is Rob ref Snyder, the move. Like, I think that's not impossible because you can call him up, put him on the bench, and you're not worried about playing him every day. But at that said, they seem to be happy with what Christian Arroyo's done in the outfield. So, yeah, he just seems repetitive with Arroyo. And if you're going to do that, I'm yeah. not sure you're going to add him to the is he, he's yeah, not him on the, to the 40. 40. He's yeah. not. Exa- and that's exactly the problem. Which is I mean, why, Yomer, like, if, if Yomer you're gonna... Sanchez has been really good too, but he's also not on the 40. That's why, if you're going to do that, I think you just go with a ruse because it's like, whatever, he can just yeah. sit on the bench and we don't really care. Whereas, like, Ref Snyder, I think, is legit depth. Like, if Christian Arroyo got hurt, I feel like Ref Snyder would be the first one to come up. Yeah, uh, yep. agreed. And now we're going to have a little bit of a role reversal. I'm going to ask Chris about what he saw when he was at the field uh, this past week as he made his way to Virginia to check out the Salem Red Sox. Not in Salem, but uh, he went to, where is it, Fredericksburg or Frederick? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, he, he, went, he went to some games. He went to Fredericksburg in Virginia to watch the Salem Red Sox. And there he was able to see, uh, I think, what, three or four games? Three games. You sure you don't need take three for that one? Um, no, no it's <laughs> that's why I'm laughing. Just that wasn't take three. That was take one or one take show. Yes, I guess. Um, no, yeah, I saw three games because Friday night's game got rained out. So I got a double header on Saturday and a uh, regular old matinee on Sunday. So it was, it was a nice weekend at the ballpark in Fredericksburg, which again, if you're in the area, Fredericksburg is a really nice ballpark. Uh, great viewing experience. Uh, they do a good promote, good, a good, uh, uh, I don't know. It's it's a it's a good atmosphere, a good place to catch a game, pretty good food, etc. So go check it out if you're in the area. But yeah, I got to see three games down there. Uh, I think Salem went one and two uh, on on Saturday's first game. They got walked off, unfortunately, and the second game they won. And then on Sunday, they ran into a buzzsaw. Uh, this uh, Fredericksburg had a young pitcher by the name of. Uh, it's like. Kind of some kind of German or, or something sounding Austrian sounding name like, like Strasburg or something. Strasburg, yeah, Strus- Strusburg, something like that. Um, I I no. think I've heard of him before. He might be good. Not potential sure. f- potential future World Series MVP um, mm. or past. Pretty high, highly regarded then. Yes, no, and it, it, I mean it was funny just the seeing those hitters. I, I talked about it last episode that seeing those hitters try and face it. Was, you know, the off speed was really where it was just like. They're not used to seeing a guy being able to backdoor a slider like that, you know, or just throw a change up that falls off the plate that they thought was going to come in in the outer half and it just disappears on them. So I think it was it was a good learning experience for the players, even if they didn't necessarily succeed in hitting him. So that was good. But yeah, I caught uh, three games. Uh, I don't know who you want. I mean, I, I might as well just jump in with the obvious first guy you want me to talk about him, Wickelman Gonzalez, who started the first game on Saturday. What's his name? Wickelman, Wickelman. It's pronounced Wickelman. There's no N in there, so. There's no Wickelman. L. You call. You said Winkleman. I did not say Winkleman. Yes, you did. It sounded I like did that not, to me. Okay, it might have sounded like that. I did not. Say. Anyway, Wickelman Gonzalez. You don't get the benefit of the doubt after John Sh- I, uh, Sh- Shiner or whatever. Or Schneider. The, you are the. You don't even know his name now. Anyway, you know his name. You don't know his name. Wick. <laughs> this is terrible audio. Wickelman Gonzalez um, started the first game on Saturday. It was my first time seeing him in person. And, and honestly, I, 
I liked what I saw, but I also get where some of the concerns we've heard from scouts come from speaking generally about the, you know, the delivery it's very in you and you you've, I mean, yes. I'm just, have you seen him during the regular season this year? No, no, but I saw him twice in spring training. You saw him twice in spring training. Yeah. I didn't realize you saw him twice. I knew you saw him once, but like, you like you were saying, I mean, it's first of all, you know, it's, it's the body's okay. It's not great. It's not bad. The, the mecha- pitch mechanics, it's just very herky jerky is not the word. It's just kind of almost like a buggy whip kind of arm action where he's got a big stab behind, you know, he comes to a set he's stiff. He's, he's not, the, he's stiff. not loose. He's not athletic. It. It's like he steps to the yeah. left, moves, swings, like brings the back leg to the left as well. Then comes up and over. He's got a big old like stab behind and, you know, big arm motion as he comes forward. It's like a buggy whip sort of arm action. I just didn't love it. Just didn't seem like it wasn't that anything needed to get cleaned up in the mechanics. It's not like, you know, some we've seen guys where, you know, I'm trying to think of examples, but we've had guys through the years where you look and there's like, Oh, there's like 18 things going on. And I mean, like Hauk maybe is one guy where you're just like, okay, there's some side to side here. They could clean up. The arm is going all over the place. There's some stuff that he could, he could clean up there and he didn't necessarily repeat it. Um, great. Every time, you know, he, he would sometimes, you know, just kind of get on, he wouldn't, he loses like arm action. He'd kind of like pull the ball a little bit. Uh, and just kind of, you know, sometimes he would be pulling the ball. Sometimes he would leave the ball arm side and just not finish his pitches. Um, but that said, I mean, it was impressive stuff still. Um, you know, he came out throwing mostly like 95, 96, touching 97 after, a, you know, th- that was in the first inning where he was super impressive through nine pitches, six of them for strikes. Um, you know, got a strikeout swinging on a ni- the 97 mile per hour fastball he threw. But then came out in the second inning, you know, first batter, 95, 96. Now he's starting to slip into 94. And then by the middle of the second inning, he was 94 to, uh, or sorry, like more 90, yeah, 94, 95, touching 96 the rest of the outing. Um, one thing that started bad but turned out good to me was that in that second inning, he comes out, gives up a single, a single, and a home run to left that was just destroyed on a 92-mile-per-hour fastball absolutely crushed. Um, Fredericksburg has some guys who could really hit. They, they had uh, a couple guys on Sunday who both hit multiple home runs. I mean, they had some guys who could just rake um, and drop bombs. So after the home run walks a guy on four pitches, hits the next guy, his control is just shot at this point. And I'm like, wow, he's not going to make it out of the second inning. Then he hunkers down and the la- faces three more batters that inning strikeout swinging on a change up strikeout, swinging on a change up strikeout, looking at 95. Really just came back, even started the next inning with a strikeout swinging on another change up, um, then get a couple more ground balls, wound up finishing four innings. For him to battle back to get through four was really impressive to me that he had that there in him. Um, the other secondary is the change up, his best pitch. Like I mentioned, multiple swinging uh, strikeouts on the pitch. It's, you know, 87 to 89, good action on it, kind of fades away. Um, has a ton of confidence in the pitch can be a little firm sometimes, but I'm with you potential plus offering, um, also threw a curveball that was, you know, 78 to 80 or so that, you know, clear third pitch. It was fine. It was serviceable. He didn't always get over it. In fact, I posted a video on Twitter of one that he just really didn't get over and just kind of like not air mailed, but just kind of aired to the, you know, right-hand hitters, batters box to a lefty hitter. So you know, he's still got a work, work to do on the breaking ball, but seems to have scrapped the slider he was throwing because uh, I didn't see him throw it. He was just throwing the curve. I like him. Um, we've got him. Where do we have him now, Ian? We've got him 12, I think. Uh, to me, definitely, you know, I didn't see anything that would make me want to put him ahead of that C. Baldwin-Kowski group in AAA and, and Chris Murphy in AA, in part because of the proximity. Um, yeah, I, it's that he he might have more upside than those guys, but just yeah. so much can happen in the you know three four years he's got left to get up to the big leagues. Whereas those guys, I mean, Winkowski and Seabold have both made their debut, and Murphy's been excellent in uh, Portland this year. So he's someone who I think we could see up in Worcester pretty soon too. So yeah, if if there's room, like we said last like yeah. we said last episode. Um, but that was interesting. The other two starters I, I, I saw that day because they piggybacked them were Angel Bastardo, Angel Bastardo and Felix Cepeda. Uh, I, I liked both of them as kind of potential back end of the 60 guy, top 60 guys. Um, Bastardo 
came out, he was 95 to 96 through three innings, got through him pretty much unscathed. He get, did give up a wall ball double, um, another hard hit single in his third inning of work. Showed pretty good off speed as well, honestly, better off speed than we saw when we saw him in spring training. Ian, um, you know, the curveball was like anywhere between 80 and 86, which is usually with these younger guys, a sign that they're really still working on things. But Got a few swinging strikes on, you know, curves between 80 and 84. I think in that lower range, it works a little better. And then the change up was, you know, 86, a couple coming in around 88. Um, but again, got a couple swinging strikes on those as well. So uh, showing three pitches that he could work with. Uh, I, I'm interested to see where that goes going forward. It was good to catch him coming off of the IL. And he was followed by Felix Cepeda, a guy who we had heard good things about a, a few years back. Was that 19? I think we heard some good things about him out of, uh, out of, uh, extended or, or the rookie league. It was, it was, uh, 19. Yeah. Yeah. 19. And you know, he's in Salem now, uh, was a late promotion to Salem. He started the year in extended, but he's like uh, completely revamped himself. Though. Very different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was, he throws, I think he was throwing both a two seam and a four seam fastball. Uh, I, I know. I, when I talked to someone who saw him, they said he was like 94 to 97. Was, um, I saw him up to 96. I didn't see any 97 out of him, but he was also throwing some some fastballs that were coming in at like 91, 92. Could be a changeup, honestly. Well, well, the thing is, his changeup I had anywhere between 83 to 88. Oh, he did. Okay, but those would so, be pretty firm uh, yeah. to be cha- again. Could very possible that those were changeups. I, I don't know. I, I I'll have that. Yeah, to I mean, but that's out. what I, I had those as probably two seams, um, and then he was throwing a slider. You know, 86 ish. Um, didn't throw too many of them. He was mostly going fastball, four seam, two seam change up. Yeah, I think I've only got one slider on here, two sliders, 85 and 86. So uh, he looked pretty good as well. Got, uh, you know, a couple swinging strikeouts on 90 mile per hour fastballs that were probably two seams. Um, another, you know, three swinging, three swinging strikes, strikeouts on a curveball at 83, a two seam at 91, and another curveball at 84. I think and- it was a slider. You think it, it was, was a slider? Oh, it's it a slider. De- it's a slider. definitely a slider. Sorry. It's not yeah, a, curve, a slider. That's why he's like 80, 8, 94, 97 sliders, like mid 80s, like 83 to 86. Yep. Um, yeah. No, it's a slider. His, You're right. His, his change up, I'm not good. good, but yeah. He's, well, he's, he's like, I a mean, fa- yeah, it was, he, he threw a few of them. Um, he's like a fastball slider, like reliever now, yeah, which is probably, interesting. Probably. But yeah, That's no, I mean, he's got a good arm. So he he's definitely reinvented himself and is interesting now. Yeah, he was interesting. And then um, the third starter, sorry, the fourth starter I saw on Sunday. And I mean, I've got Velos. I don't really trust him because I had to use the scoreboard on Sunday because there were no scouts in attendance with radar guns, which was interesting in the six game series era. That's what you get. And plus, when you've got a day where a major leaguer is rehabbing and the park was but packed, I, had, I also I think it's because they can just they can just look up the Velos after the game. They don't need them like in there. Well, I'm just saying like there was heat there, but it was from the Nats watching Strasburg. Like it uh, wasn't, well, then they don't care. Yeah. Right. So, and then uh, that's what I was saying. Like the scouts that were there the night before were not there on Sunday. And I think yeah. in part was, be- it was packed because of Strasburg. I had to park literally about a mile away. And it's also, uh, got my steps in w- Wickelman. It would have been their second time seeing him that week. So well, or whoever started Gabriel, Sunday, Gabriel Jackson. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Jackson. So he's, that's like, well, that's what I'm saying in the six game series. You've already seen the starters. You've already seen the entire bullpen by that point. You don't necessarily need to go on Sunday unless there's a particular reason you want to, and they're not going to go to see Steven Strasburg because that's not their job. Uh, but anyway, it was just a bunch of sinkers uh, and just a bunch of ground balls off of it. I mean, like, looking at this, I've got, you know, two in the first inning, one, uh, two, three in the second inning, one, two, and third, one in the fourth. Um, but that said, you know, he's he's low 90s to 89, 89 to 92 on the sinker. Um, and when it got hit, I mean, he gave up a couple of absolute bombs. Uh, Infante and Emiliani were the two guys who went deep twice that game, and he just gave up some absolute jacks. Um, you know, also threw a slider that was meh. Uh, 83 to 84 or so on the scoreboard uh, gun, which, you know, you never know how accurate those are. Uh, you know, he was okay. Uh, I, I think I might like it better in the bullpen as a guy who comes in to get, you know, ground ball outs when you've got guys on base rather than as a starter. But um, yeah, those were the, that was the bullpen. And I, I don't know who, who do you want, who do you want to hear about first in the lineup? Ian? 
Um, I think, well, you did, unfortunately didn't see Marcelo Meyer, which That's he would have been the yes. first one. So I, I think that um, it'd be good to hear about like Blaze Jordan, maybe since I'm sure that's what the people want to hear about. That is true. Yeah, Jordan didn't do a whole lot. He sat the second game of the doubleheader, so I only saw him for two games. Uh, was 0 for 8 in those two games. Uh, oh, no, sorry. He had one hit um, that actually I kind of like. In, in his first second at bat on Saturday, um, spit on a on a curveball uh, one pitch, and the next pitch got the same curveball again at 78 and pulled it past the third baseman. So I really kind of like the adjustment he showed there. That was kind of interesting, but otherwise it was, you know, a bunch of ground balls and flyouts that, you know, he wasn't striking out, but it also wasn't necessarily great contact either. Did he pull anything for you? Uh, he hits right-handed, right? Yep. So he, let's see, uh, four, three pulled the, he pulled the hit, you know, three unassisted fly out to center that I think was to right center. Another, you know, um, oh, he did have a strikeout swinging on a slider, ground ball to second, fly out to right, fly out to center. So he w- wasn't pulling anything. No, and that's that's the biggest I think concern for me, and something that that multiple people have have expressed to me is that he just does. He has a lot of trouble with velocity, and he just doesn't pull pull the ball with authority much. So that's um that's obviously something that's kind of concerning, but we'll 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 see how it develops. Um. Because obviously, you know, he's been since that initial, since his struggles uh, in April, he's, you know, still hitting 319, 368, 496, just not a lot of power. And I think that was kind of what people expected was that, you know, that light tower power, because we've seen those videos of him taking batting practice. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if he can make some adjustments, kind of, you know, square the ball up and pull it with more authority, because that's definitely something that, uh, if it doesn't get exposed at the lower, if it's already an issue in low A, it's definitely going to be more of an issue as he faces more advanced pitching and moves up the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just, you know, he did it's it, the body. It's just like a weird body type. Like it, he's not super duper athletic um, for me. So it, it, yeah, you know, for a guy who had a pretty good statistical month, like it's not, he didn't strike, you know, stand out to me. The, the big guys that kind of stood out to me, you know, Paulino, you know, looks the part Brian or Bonas, looks the part uh even nico cavadas is the power guy i mean he's out there you know hunting for home runs but he's also got a pretty good approach where he's not swinging at bad pitches to do so i mean he's out there taking you know hacks um when he gets his pitch to hit but he's also not you know selling out to get home runs for uh no on bad pitches so um yeah jordan was kind of eh. uh, cavadas had a yeah, absolute bomb of a rainmaker the thing is he's got such an upper cavadas had such an uppercut swing it's like a softball swing he just that, like even the home run it was just super high it wasn't that it was far it was just like up and out of the barn silo type well no he, he also hits tanks i've seen him hit well he does like, but in, i'm in saying spring it's... training he had some absolute nukes but yeah yeah but i'm just saying like it's it's the way the swing works it's it, the ball's going up as well as out. It's it's not a line drive swing at all. It's it's designed to put the ball in the air. Um, so no, I mean he's out. definitely, but you know, I mean he's been someone who he's got you know, since the beginning of May. He's got a three eighty eight OBP and a, he's got eighteen walks and one hundred and sixteen plate appearances. He's getting on base a ton. It's just contact it's questionable, and yeah, it's you know how much will the power play because if. The, is the how much is the power going to actualize if he can't make enough consistent contact? Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah. I mean, otherwise, you know, I, I don't know who else you got. I, I think let you Paulino is that. there. Uh, did you, what did you see out of him? Because he's obviously find my damn Paulino page. Hang on. <laughs> like I'm looking through. I've got all the. What I do is I print out our scouting reports, and for whatever reason, I can't find his right now. There's Tyler Miller. Yeah, I mean, I, I think because if you look at the team, it, it's interesting how the, the the kind of rosters evolve from coming into the year. The outfield was seen as pretty interesting, and now they're all either injured or been demoted. The guys that we were kind of interested to see, mm-hmm. so they're running more like a you know kind of a man outfield. I mean, Tyler Miller wasn't even didn't even play outfield in spring training. When well, we were actually, there. but it's interesting because I, I had forgotten about this because I found real. I remember this because I print the scouting report. He played outfield a decent amount at Auburn. Oh, did he? Okay. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, he played a bunch of different positions there, yes. and like, and they're playing like Carson Seamus a bunch in right field too, which and, is weird. Um, That's the weird one. I mean, but it, it also kind of fits because he's kind of big for a middle infielder. 
Like he can play second. I, I didn't love him at short. I bet at second he was okay. He's just very. It's it's like a CJ Chatham type. He's tall and long strides. It's not, you know that that's what I saw out of him. I don't know. You're looking at me like you disagree, but middle. So it's interesting that they're playing him a lot in right field. But I kind of get it because at the same time, you have Paulinho, you have Meyer, and you have to get him reps. Uh, Bonasi yeah. ahead of him, so he's not going to get a lot of time ahead of those those guys. And he's going to get absolutely zero time at shortstop with those three on the roster because he's. Well, I mean, yeah, no one is. I mean, Meyer is the shortstop, Blake. Well, right, Paulino. but I'm just saying, even 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 without Meyer there, he's behind. Oh Paulino yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I I can't find my stupid Paulino notes, but I mean, I'll talk about. I mean, bonusy. I'll say the dog eat your homework. The dog, no, the the cat on my lap ate my homework. Um. I don't know where the hell it went. I was looking at it earlier. I'm going to find it the second we get off the, uh, the podcast, but yeah. Um, bonusy. Yeah. He was pretty good. He had, he, he had singles in both games. He played, he played, on, uh, he, he played on, I think both games were on Saturday. Um, in the first game he had a hit in the first where he stayed back on 90. He was able to stay back, but take 94 to right center for a single. Um, you know, struck out in his next at back, then had a at bat, then had a walk and a ground out, which is kind of the bonusy, you know, a walk and a single type game. But um, the next day, got hit by a pitch, um, singled to left, went Oppo on uh, 94, so he was able to pull it in, in the first game and uh, went Oppo within the second game. Looked pretty good, I think. You know, he's he's playing a decent amount of short stuff, of second base right now, which is interesting because you know it's it's a plus arm accuracy might be a little shaky he had one throw that i think pulled the first baseman off the bag um it's definitely strong accuracy maybe maybe could make take a little bit of work but um i i yeah, liked him i mean he didn't jump out at me the way that you know other guys have in the past but he was okay it's just it's a weird body like he's short stocky there's not a lot of physical projection and yeah it's just you don't see a lot of guys i think i feel like built like him as a, as young as he is um so that's kind of the weird part. And then, of course, if you want to hear more, we'll have more about that on the uh, Patreon game updates. Once I get all those uploaded, they're there. I just got to get them up. So sorry for our patrons. Those will be those will be up soon. So, Ian, let's move on to emails. All right. As always, if you want to send us an email, send it to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. So hit us up. And our first email comes from our friend of the show, Aaron Meta, who says, hi, guys. So this is entirely random, but I just learned that Jed Lowry has appeared in 31 games so far this year at age 38. If I recall when he came up, the read was that he was a bat first middle infielder who was likely a bench guy who was bat first with defensive questions. If my memory is off there, please correct me. I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts about the fact he's now playing in his 14th season. If he's the Sox prospect who has most exceeded what he looked like uh, he would be when he first came up. In other words, consider this a, ch- a chance to remember a guy who seems to have made the most of his time in the league. Thanks. Um, I don't remember that part of it. I, I mean, granted, I was a complete noob at this when Jed Lowry was in the system, and that was well before Ian's time with the website. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't remember. I was, uh, I was I young. I, was a, I mean, I, there, there was a chance he might have to move to second, and he's never been a stud defensive shortstop. I don't. I think would be fair to say. Well, he wasn't really ever a shortstop. Lowry. Yeah. I mean, he plays. He's played a fair amount of it, but he's he's never been a starting major league shortstop. The last time he played shortstop was 2016. For okay, two so he's games. just second base now. Okay. I mean, the he, thing with he Lowry plays. He's he, he's a DH now, but his he thing played was always uh, injuries, and that's how it played out in the majors. He too. played second base last year for 70 games. Right, but again, he was 37. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just saying that I'm talking he, he, about earlier in his uh, he was second base, yeah, third base, second base, third base. He played a little bit of shortstop in 2015 and uh, 20 well, 2015 was the last time he played more than like you know a few games. In 2014, he was a shortstop for the entire season. But yeah, he's well, kind of like saying. jumped around. Well, saying. that I mean, I he mean, was 30 at that point. But yeah, right, right. So anyway, I mean, so I guess I guess the question then is: Is someone who who has exceeded what he looked like he would be when he first came up um i mean i guess just as far as guys who've stuck around i mean they tend to be in like the bullpen i feel like because you get guys like jose alvarez who've like been around forever who just kind of snuck up on you i mean we really liked him in lowell but then he just kind of disappeared in part because they traded him um but he's made a you know career in the bullpen around the league i don't know if you've got anyone in mind ian um um yeah no one's really i mean 
I, I always think it's funny when I see like someone like Hunter Strickland is still like, you know, jumping around in the bull pettons. Mm-hmm. Um, guys like him, like I remember Hunter Cervenko was up a couple years ago and I was like, yeah. oh, wow. Did not realize he was still like playing baseball because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. obviously once they get traded, it's a little harder to follow. Sure. Um, and that's usually what winds up um, happening. It's a guy that falls off our radar, but he's still kind of an up and down. I mean, yeah. no way Ramirez still being kind of he's a been like good though. guy slash setup guy. Yeah, he's with I don't even know where Arizona he's now. now Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, good question, Aaron. Our next question comes from here we go. Uh Rajiv. Oh, we I, well, while we're on that, I just want to shout out Anderson Espinosa for making his major league hey, debut. Good call. Yes. Um it's really impressive that he's made it all the way back and he basically missed four full seasons. Mm-hmm. And I just like I just want to state that he was unbelievable when I saw him in Greenville yeah. and like as an 18 year old, like you it was one last of the episode. Yeah. It was one of the, I think it was on Twitter. I don't think it was last episode, but oh. um, it was one of the most impressive, like teenage pitching performances that I've ever seen. And I don't even think his numbers were that good, but his stuff was just so nasty. He was like up to 98 with a 70 curveball as an 18 year old. And obviously, you know, injuries suck and they happen, but to see him up in the big leagues and striking people out was pretty cool. Yeah. He got optioned back to double a today, but I mean, he, Made the debut. He's a major leaguer, so good for him. Uh, again, an next email comes from Rajiv. He says, seeing that Chris Murphy has moved up a few slots in the rankings and wondering if this is due to an increased possibility that he can stick as a starter. And then he has another question, but I guess with that, Ian, is it increased possibility that he could stick as a starter? I, th- I think it's mostly that he's answering some questions we had. Ah, Sorry, there's an enormous bug in my room, um, in my office here. Uh, That's what happens when you have pets in the room. Yeah. They let bugs in. Um, I I do think he does have a slightly better chance to start. I do think I know some scouts who do think that he could actually be a starter. Not convinced entirely still, but um, he's definitely, I think, taking a step forward in that regard this year. And um, I think it could come down to that, that similar situation to we kind of talked about with Tanner Houck, where they might be able to start, but they're, the role they will be most effective in is not necessarily as a starter. And I think that's um, that's kind of w- where I think Murphy might be most effective in like a long relief role. But yeah, um, he's he's Did definitely you see this. Yeah, I can see it. Um, it's probably a stink bug that those. No, it's huge. It's like a millipede. Okay, that's dealt with. Sorry. Um, yeah, and then so Rajiv's second question is: right-handed hitting opponents have a 550 OPS against him this year, which feels like a very welcome development considering his struggles against righties last year. Are these improvements, actual developments for him, or am I reading into the situation too much? Last question: Is it possible we see him anytime into the already and he see him move into the already loaded Wu Sox rotation anytime soon? Now that he's made 15 starts at Double A, I think we've answered all of those. I think either today or last episode. So, um, um I will say that I, I do think that it, you know, he, the with the fast, it's with against righties, he's just got to locate, and I think his command has definitely improved this year. I, I don't think it's at the level it needs to be yet, but. I do think he's made strides in that regards. And I think that's definitely helped him. Um, even if like it's not showing with the walk numbers, like his, his, you know, his BB nine and stuff is like pretty similar to what it was last year. But I do think that he's doing a better job against righties uh, commanding. Mm-hmm. Our next question comes from Rick. I really like this question. He goes, first off, I apologize for posing a question that has nothing to do with the Red Sox farm system, but I've recently been made aware of the Savannah bananas. 75-year-old Bill Spaceman Lee does pitch on occasion, so there's a connection, even if it's atrocious. My question is, one, are you aware of them? Two, do you think it's good for baseball? While not having seen them, I assume they are the globetrotters of baseball, but that might not be fair. Just interested in your thoughts. Uh, Yes, I have heard of them. Same. To explain them for the uninitiated, the Savannah Bananas are in Savannah, Georgia. They're an independent league team. I guess technically they're like a college Summerwood Bat League team. But it's basically like Bill Vec, um brought into the TikTok era is how I might describe it. Um, like the players are in on the joke. Like they do choreographed dances. I thought the pitch. Harlem Globetrotters of baseball comparison was pretty good too. I, I like it too. And I've thought of that. It's, uh, the, the only then, reason it's I mean, different is it's not that they are, it's the entertainment value piece of it, but it's not because they are like super prolific at the game. Like there's no guy like hitting you know, 900 foot home court. runs or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like there's a guy who swings a bat flaming bat. There's a guy who, you know, they do the choreographed 
you know, pre the guy who hits on stilts or whatever. Yeah. They have a guy on stilts sometimes like, yeah. So it's entertainment. Um, here's the thing. They sell out every game. They travel and sell out every game. Um, they make money hand over fist. I think the guy is a genius. Um, look, there's room for both that and MLB, right? Whatever brings more fans to the game, you know, you get a fan who goes to watch a Savannah bananas game. Cause they want to check it out and they go to a couple more games. And they think it's fun. And, Oh, Hey, there's a minor league baseball game in my town. Maybe I'll go check that out. And they go see it like, Oh, baseball's not as boring as I was told it was or whatever the heck. Right. Like, I think it can only be good for the game. I can't see how it would be bad for the game. So I, I'm a fan of it. I don't know, but what do you no, think? I, I think it's great for the game. Um, I, I think that it, they've they've found a niche that is really good for growing the game. And I think they should keep doing what they're doing because, um, as you said, you know, it's clearly working. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, our next question comes from Brad. He says, hi, Chris and Ian. And watching Whitlock's transition to full-time rotation member, how do you think he's looked? His first few starts were electric and a carryover from his success as a reliever. As the starts have accumulated, though, his success has waned with batters having an easier time making contact, C-E-G, tonight's game. This culminated in a start where he got zero Ks recently. What do you see his future role being? Do you think letting his stuff play up out of the pen and one to two inning stints 50-plus times a year would be a better use of his talent? I mean, Ian, that's the million-dollar question, right? Yeah, I I think know. Yeah, we don't know because I also think that this year is a hard one to judge him on because while he did, they told him to like mm-hmm. prepare to be a starter. He didn't start the season as a starter and he right. wasn't that for the first whatever, you know, X number of weeks it was. And then he had to build up to, to get starters workload. And I, I think there's just a very different mentality from when you come into camp and you work all off season knowing you're going to be, you know, you need to handle 200 plus innings versus what he was dealt with. And I do think that is impacting him. Um I just think that there's some weird stuff going on with like his pitches, like his slider is like arm slot is off, but his slider is changing like from game to game. Like today was like three miles an hour faster than the last game on average. And like, that's just weird to be switching that in season. His sinker is not as effective with runners on base. That was something the angels broadcast did a really good job pointing out tonight. And something, if you watch the video, it's very noticeable. Like he's getting crushed with guys on base. And, um, I, I think that there definitely have been some growing pains and I do think that maybe he potentially could have been more effective in uh, the bullpen in a pure bullpen role. But at the same time, I think they, they kind of like they back themselves in the corner because they clearly don't like Hauken as a starter, which I, I mean, I don't you know necessarily dispute that. I, I think he's better in a bullpen role too. And they don't have anyone else to be the fifth starter right now. Like it's gotta be one of them. And if they think Whitlock's better than Hauken, then they have no choice, but to do Whitlock. So yeah, I yeah. Think that's right. I think that's right. I, and I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's a reason they signed him to the contract they did long term. Um, it's it's you know they're going to well, try I, it this year while they can, and if it, if they need to move the bullpen, I don't think that's giving up on him. Well, and the thing either. is, I I think that he eventually the plan is probably to move him to the bullpen because they, they think they're going to be adding Chris Sale and Paxton at some point. If they get both those guys back, you know, he's going to have to be pushed to the bullpen for one of them. Like I don't see any way both of them go to the bullpen also. So right, right. Um, I I think that. You know, he's got, you know, and I mean, sale keeps getting pushed back. I don't know when he's going to pitch again, but like, well, he just threw a bullpen or something. No, but he had a setback. He also had a setback with like a, no, it was like, he was sick. It wasn't like an arm or anything. It was just like the the old one, not one. No, that was like recently. Like how recently? Like it got reported today. Today. Okay. That's yeah. That's what I was trying to get at. Okay. So I I hadn't heard that yet. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. It was, um, anyway. All right. Well, anyway, let's move on to the next uh, Chris season. Sale re- okay. bullpen pushback as Red Sox starter has stomach bug. That was okay. from this morning. So okay. he didn't pitch his bullpen today. Okay. So like, That's... we don't know when he's going to be back, but whenever, you know, whether it's him or Paxson or whoever comes back first, I can see them pushing Whitlock to the bullpen. Our next email comes from David B, our Patreon backer. And he says, uh, he, the email subject is we don't talk about baseballs. And he apologizes to Ian for the Encanto reference as half-assed as it is. I don't know why he's only apologizing to you. I think I deserved an apology as well, but whatever. Um, he says, second and more importantly, WTF is going on with the baseballs. The day Brandon Walter made his AAA debut, I saw a post on the forums that MILB is supposedly using different baseballs between AAA and the levels below possible difference in seam height and after when that's debut, correct it, and after de- when debut at the mlb level he made a comment about the ball being kind of mushy 
it's one thing for MLB to play around with rules in the minors to see how they impact, how they impact pace of play, et cetera. But playing around with the ball itself, if this is accurate, it seems such a terrible idea. So for the actual questions, what are you hearing about potential differences across levels in the minors? And if they are different, do you expect it to have any short or long-term impact on pitchers' ability to sustain their production as they move up? Uh, I imagine it's just a question of the pitchers making somewhat minor adjustments, but I'm curious about your thoughts. Thanks again for all your hard work. Um, I think it's AAA is using the MLB ball, but not Correct. in a humidor. Correct. That and that, this is known. Um, the reason is that the MLB ball is more expensive than the minor league ball. Right. And they don't want to, with the number of baseballs that the lower league, lower affiliates go through and the amount of money they make, they don't want to pay for MLB balls for them. So and they, it, this, and it's, yeah. And they've only recently gone to using the MLB ball and AAA. Like yeah. they realized it might be a good idea to have the AAA guys get used to the baseball. But yeah, so, so below double A and below is the same so. baseball. Triple A is the MLB ball minus the humidor. And I think that I would assume the humidor is what's accounting for what Winkowski was talking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's I, I, I think if it was, you know, different for different teams, it, it, it might be, you know, a different story. But since every team is, has to have their pitchers adjust the same thing, that's just it kind of is what it is. I think it impacts some pitchers more than others. Um, I mean, we're seeing like Brian Bett is not really having any issues with it. So yeah, I, I think it's just something that the pitchers just have to get used to, and it might take a little bit of time, but they'll figure it out eventually. And there's a completely separate issue about MLB messing with the MLB ball from year to year. That or you know, in not, season, or in season, which apparently they're like mid May. Mm, yeah, mid mid May. Th- there was an this baseball. This baseball is not playing like the one that was in April. I mean, yeah. I'll say that. Like, oh, there's watching... there, mid May. There is a statistical uptick in home runs. Like it is very clear. Yeah, the like, ball was like dead as a doorknob for the first six weeks of the season. And then all of a sudden it's like starting to return to normal. So exactly. yeah, exactly. So anyway, all right. Next email comes from Dave. We got a few more Ian. Um, he says, gentlemen, let me open by thanking you as a long suffering Sox fan from Albany, New York for more than 20 years of, uh, for more than 20 years of great pleasure. I think he's okay for more Albany, New York for more than 20 years. It is a great pleasure reading SoxProspects.com. Your excellent scouting reports have given me insights necessary for Red Sox management to break my heart with their trade decisions every year. Um, I think that's made tongue in cheek with that in mind. I noticed a, detra- a distressing trend and wanted your thoughts about it from Nomar to Benintendi. Every time I buy the Jersey of a player, I love to watch. They leave the team within six months. My question then is which Jersey do you think I'm going to buy next? As a follow-up question, which jersey do you want me to buy? Thanks, Dave. Um, fair enough. Thanks, Dave. I mean, there's probably a good time to mention my rule of thumb, Ian, or two rules of thumb for buying jerseys. A, don't buy the jersey of a player who you don't think is going to be on the team within a couple of years because you're not going to want to wear it. B, don't buy the jersey of a player who you are not going to still want to wear it, even if they are not on the team in a couple of years. I think that that's been my big rule of thumb. That's why, like, the jerseys I own, own are Nomar, Jason Veritek, and Jonathan Papelbon. And Papelbon, I probably broke that rule a little bit, but I kind of wore down because I was working at Olympia Sports at the time anyway, uh, and I got an employee discount. That said, um, which jersey do you think he is going to buy next? And I think he's saying which player do you think gets traded next from the major league team? Um, I don't know about traded, but I, I mean, do we want to be stinkers and say Xander Bogarts? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, like I, I think if that's the dangerous one to buy right now. That's um, definitely the dangerous one to buy. Just buy a Devers jersey. They're, I can't see them not signing him. And if they don't, then... I don't know. It's yeah. Yeah. That would be my recommendation. That's probably where I would go to at this point is Devers. Um, that's really the only, I mean, they just don't have a lot of Jersey guys right now. I mean, the story is going to be around for a while. If you like Trevor story, he ain't going anywhere. So you can roll with that one safely. Um, and then our next and final question, Ian comes from Julian. He says, dear Ian and Chris, I was looking on Baseball Savant and saw that our three major league outfielders, Verdugo, Hernandez, and JBJ, have good reaction times but take less than optimal routes on fly, on fly balls, or in other words, they're below MLB average. Duran is more of the same. I was wondering if there's anyone in the Red Sox minor leagues who you'd say takes good routes to the ball regardless of their reaction time or how athletic they are. Also, do scouts 
quantify this somehow or is it just quote he gets a good read on it end quote thanks julian um that's a good question julian i mean i think as far as the last part it's tough for scouts to do because you just in a, in a six it's game just a, set, it's a it's a feel thing it's a feel thing it's just it's hard to see guys get enough fly balls for one thing to get a yeah you might not even ball. get a good opportunity right um it's a feel thing because you can kind of you watch infield outfield and then you hope to see you know one or two good ones during the course of the week but yeah it's definitely more of a feel thing for that um i would say rafael is probably the best defensive outfielder they have no he's question. uh and but i i mean yeah like the roots look fine to me but yeah i mean it's i think that, pretty good as well yeah i just think that like i think the root thing is a little bit overrated in the sense that like it's hard to optimize a root because they're humans and humans right. inherently make mistakes or you know like they're not a computer, like a computer is going to have a way to get there, but like, that's not how it works. Like they're going to get a read and they're going to go to where they think the ball is going to go. And like, it might be a little off, but they'll adjust and get it. And that's fine to me versus like, that's like, I think more important to me is like, what is your initial read? Like, are you going the right direction off the crack of the bat? Like, cause that's how you make up for an inefficient route is being good with your first step and, you know, your initial reads and then having that closing speed. Yeah, I think I think roots is almost a it's almost an analog for how well you read fly balls, right? It's not necessarily like you know where it's going and you take a stupid route there. Like it's you did a bad job reading where the ball was going. And like once or twice you just get a bad read on it and it happens. It happens to the best outfielders, but like it's how well consistently do you do that, right? Um you know, JBJ for example, you know, in his heyday with the Red Sox was a guy who would get a great jump. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, being at the, seeing the Red Sox at the Orioles recently, and he's going the right direction before the ball is hit. You know, it's, it's uncanny. Um, are his roots good or bad? I don't know. Um, but that said, it's, 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 it's like you said, it's a feel thing. So, uh, but again, thank you for everyone for the emails. Again, it's podcast at SoxProspects.com. Hit us up. And with that, Ian, I think we'll uh, wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. Of course, thank you all for supporting us on the podcast. And of course, again, on the Sox Prospects donation drive, SoxProspects.com slash donate. We appreciate anyone who wants to give us some support. If you like what we do, think about chipping in there um, or on Patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. We want to shout out our all, shout out all of our $5 level supporters. That is in the ever-growing list. Kyle C., Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim, Hart, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb, Kev, Deb Kendall, Evan Kirkwood, Hurricanes 1, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kennedy, Andrew Wallen, David B., Ben Burnett, Al Mendel, Kevin Petridis, Ben and R.I., Paul Denier, Lendl Martin, James P. McMahon, Stephen Gregory, James Bailey, Andreas Goldstrand, Corey Perrick, Forrest Perkins, Mark Herman, Aaron Matta, Jeff Harwood, Jimmy Mountain, Brian Cowan, Dusty G., Pavel, Jordan Shabbat, Jeffrey Scruggs, Nicholas Staropoli, Bob Introne, Mike Kawana, Chris Bollier, Curtis Waltman, Michael Stewart, Keith Fox, Caleb Farron, John Keane, Andrew K., Tim Ware, Michael Murphy, Jason Stoneburner, Jack Monahan, and our newest $5 level Patreon supporter, Jason Parker. Thank you, Jason, thanks for joining the crew. We appreciate it. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. Follow Ian at Ian Cundall. That's I A N C U N D A L L. And follow me at SP Chris Hatfield. Follow the site on Twitter and Facebook at Sox Prospects. Uh, and of course, I mentioned the email earlier. Hit us up with your emails. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back in your eardrum soon with uh, non-milestone episode 251. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody.